Hello dear viewer, it's me, again, with an awesome recording to traverse the terrain of short stories all the way from Lidudu Maningani Mkomboti's uh, Memories Were Lost from South Africa to Dilman Dillon's Stones Bounds on Water, Uganda. We'll do a summary of all the short stories in Memories Were Lost and other stories and when you subscribe you always get these excellent videos. Lududu Malingani Mkombothi's Memories We Lost. It is about tenderness and compassion to those who suffer mentally or to those who are mentally ill. It is about care and concern for those who are considered mentally ill. Despite her sister suffering from mental disorder, the narrator loves her and does everything in her power to prevent her from harassment. The traditional practices that endanger her life are the main uh, troublesome aspects that overcome or seem to derail the life of the mentally ill sister. The narrator de deliberately drops out of school to take care of her own sister and uh, she understands that she's suffering from schizophrenia. In the memories, the narrator can remember how her sister has been sick for a long time. She only remembers how she has suffered in this life and how she has had to contend with the society's lack of understanding of her condition. She can recall major attacks her sister has suffered and the ritual the Sangomas have been called about to perform on her. However, the narrator clearly displays that she believes all these rituals cannot cure her sister. When her mother and stepfather plan to take her back uh, to a baker, she steals her sister away to a modern hospital where she hopes, against all hope, that the unknown people will treat her sister in the way that is required. Story number two is uh, How Much Land Does Man Need by Leo Tolstoy of Russia. This is about the consequences of human greed or how human greed can lead to their detriment. The farmer per home of Russia has 123 acres of land and he learns that the Bakshirs have land that they sell for a thousand rubles wherever a person is able to go around before the sun goes down. And so Pahom can't sleep way through the night, only catches a glimpse of sleep at dawn. When he raises in the morning, he goes around the field, he carries a spade to make appropriate marks at intervals of the boundary of the land that he has conquered. With every step he thinks the land becomes more fertile and always says what he could do with an extra land that he sees and therefore walks again and again until he's beat. He acquires much land but unfortunately dies out of exhaustion just before reaching the hillock where the boundary should end because that's exactly where he began. The servants of Pahom bury him at a six by four section right there. Story number three is called Light by Leslie Neka Arima of Nigeria. It's about parental role in a changing society. Nebeli and his wife are not living together. Nebeli is at home with her teenage daughter. We'll see uh, soon experience her first moon time because she's turning 14. Her wife is going to study and is faced with the challenge of raising a teenage daughter. He teaches the girl how to be a decent girl. And when she experiences her first menstruation, and then when she also experiences a joke, an elderly joke by an uncle, then the challenges of Enabeli are brought to light. He understands the fact that the society is unfair to the girl child. He doesn't punish her when she writes love letters to boys and is somebody in school. He only tells the teacher it won't happen again. He communicates to his wife via Skype, but the distance 
soon wears down the strength and tenderness of the communication between the father and the wife and the child too. The communications occurrence also diminishes. The mother tries to groom her to a decent woman from distance in vain. The girl continues to have teenage affairs and this causes conflicts between Nebeli and his wife on how to parent the young child. Mother and daughter also fight over grooming and etiquette issues. Sometimes the child takes advantage of the quarrels between the parents to increase the distance between her mother. The coldness also increases and finally a decision is made that the girl should be taken to America to stay with the mother who has found a job after completing her studies. The father is devastated because of this choice, but he has to accept it. Story number four, my father's head, written by our very own Okuri Oduor of Kenya. This story is an act, it's about acts of remembrance or thoughtfulness. Simbi remembers her father and different tension characterized by her after his death and the dwindling state of her mind. She exposes her mental stability and the African fondness towards food tries to bring out the liveliness, the inner bond of relationship between their family. Her reference is dominant in the story. Every day after work, she talks about how she bought an ear of street maize and chewed it at night. The writer uses Simbi to talk about the myriad of confusion. She describes how she happens to see her father the father's profession as a plumber and how people used to come to their house at night and even on weekends she tries to figure out how the father looked like but the memories are not very clear they're like a mirage simply tries to perform much the rituals to get rid of her father's soul through for the gnashes when she realizes her father's presence is to safeguard her she wishes to be with him, but the father decides to leave her. Story number four is The Umbrella Man by Siddhartha Gigo from India, and it's about optimism. The Umbrella Man, also number seven, lives in an institution offering shelter and support to the mentally disabled or ill people. He is uh, the only image allowed outside the compound in the evenings. The doctors gave him this because of his nature of obedience and his calm way of handling things. He unfolds his umbrella every evening and walks outside the compound hoping that it will rain. Rain hasn't come in this area for many months. And whenever he looks up and the clouds are swelling, he again unfolds his umbrella hoping that the rain will come. He lost. He has not had any visitor in many years. And no one knows how he acquired the umbrella that the other people envy. The umbrella becomes his companion. The other inmates think that it's the most beautiful thing in this particular corrections uh, center. And it's evident that everyone would like to have a touch or a hold of this particular umbrella. Many times, the umbrella man uh, sees the image of some child and he watches the child disturbed by untouched with dreams. He then confronts the child to go back to sleep and promises to be at the side. This happens every night. Another imaginary being, Ababa, asks whether it would rain and assure him that it would rain soon. He sits on the favorite bench between the asylum gate and the wall to have a conversation with the Pani Little who is a pessimist about the rains coming. The Umbra man tells him that someday it will rain, of course. He cannot sleep at night and he narrates a story to the child who sleeps. The next morning, they receive a set of new clothes, a bag and a tin that has money. He's told that he's free on the rainy day. 
He spreads his umbrella and walks out of the cell. From the gate, he wonders which path to take. The puny little fellow is gone with the rain. He sees a road that is waiting for him on the other side. And finally, his hope is fulfilled. Story number six is called Effects of War. It's written by Mariatu Kamara of Sierra Leone, and it's titled The President. Now, in this story, the narrator is a young girl who is captured by the rebels. And at Sierra Leone at this time, there is war. Those who capture a point a gun at her ready to kill her. Um, she pleads and pleads with the rebels who are just but children, possibly child soldiers. They want to cut the hand because the president sh- should feel him for victims who will not vote for him. Her hand is chopped off and the young boys who are rebels, possibly child soldiers, they celebrate. Her wounds are treated but again she's pregnant. Salu had declared to make make her his wife because she's already pregnant and she doesn't even know it. The rebels had killed him and many as well. She gave birth to Caesarean section and her story appears in a newspaper article from sympathizers and well-wishers. She is taken to Canada where she graduates from ESL with the ESL with a diploma. Now, despite her challenges, Maria Tukamara uh, passes her examination. Our seventh story is called "The Window Seat" by Benjamin Branoff of Tanzania. It's about the madness in the country because of transport especially public transport. A white man is traveling in a daladala to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. He's going to post to the post office downtown and is uncomfortable with the overload of the vehicle. That should have carried 10 people, but now 24 people are crammed inside. He's, sit, he's seated at the window. The road is in bad condition and dust goes into the window. There is noise all over, music of stereo systems, mobile music, and conductors advertising the Adeladalas, making a lot of noise. In the vehicle, the narrator encounters a beautiful girl who is putting on a kanga and is taken by the lady. Monique, the French girl, he had met in college, therefore dissipates in his mind for a while. The bus is stopped by a police officer and the narrator witnesses as the conductor and the police argue. And the police takes the key to the vehicle. The driver then gives the policeman a bribe and is given back the key. The vehicle picks up another passenger again, a woman who has no place to sit. And the narrator there, for being a, a gentleman, decides to offer his place to this woman and has to stand throughout the journey. When the vehicle stops, the standing passenger jacked forward. They have to hold to each other. The narrator realizes that Kanga has been holding on him and is carried away by this. He feels Kanga's other hand slipping off his jeans. When Kanga alights, the narrator is in dismay. He's left wondering what to say to the beautiful girl. He shifts the world of fantasy, doses off to hear the conductor shouts waking him. When he looks around, the bus is empty. He can't pay fare as demanded by the conductor because he realizes that his wallet is missing. It has been stolen probably by Kanga. What a sad and distasteful end of the story. That marks our first summary of the seven stories. We'll be back with a summary of... Uh, other stories another time. Always remember to subscribe to Sari Willy Literature to get some of these awesome recordings. Thank you for your time and God bless you. The Folded Leaf by Segan Fulabi of Nigeria. 
This is about hypocrisy in religious institutions. The Folded Leaf is a story about members of congregation who travel to the city to look for healing from various diseases and disabilities through prayer. This are Bunmi, the narrator who is blind. She travels with her father, her brother Bola. Others are Mrs. Yekere, who walks using sticks. Tunde, a boy who has a hole in his heart. And Sam, who is disabled and is on a wheelchair. They go to Lagos to attend uh, the crusade by Pastor Adajola Fayemi, also called Daddy Cole, who is rich and has a helicopter jet uh, and homes in Switzerland, Caribbean and Florida. Congregation who are traveling in one vehicle have a lot of uh, scathing experiences along the way. The police looking through the bags of uh, passengers. Mr. Ejofo, a rich man, bribes a policeman who then allows them to proceed. The crusade, uh, the couple, Mr. and Mrs. Ejofo, who are famous for their donations, the church are shown the VIP area, while the rest are shown the back area to sit at. The hope that they will be called to the main podium when the healing time come still resuscitates in them. They never get there except Bola. Uh, the pastor is emphasizing on giving generously to the church, claiming that miracles can only take place after a person has given. Papa tries to lead his people to the front to receive miracles and to be healed from their various ailments in vain. The guards who are in dark suits turn them back. The group then have to travel back to their homes, very disappointed and disillusioned because of the hypocrisy they have witnessed in the church. Story number 10 is hitting Budapest by No Violet Bulawayo of Zimbabwe. It's about a prejudiced society that is abusive. The story is told by a girl named Darling, and it's about a group of six children, Basta, Chipo, Godno, Shbo, Stina, and the narrator, who are going to Budapest to still go us. They talk about pregnancy of a 10-year-old Chipo, who was impregnated by the grandfather. The children wonder how long it takes for the babies to get out of the stomach, and why it is that it's only the girls who give birth and not the males. As they slowly move to Budapest, uh, they have to be slowed down because Chipo is pregnant and sometimes they must wait for her to take a rest. At Budapest, the guavas arrive on the trees and they wander. The children eat the guava and move to the next street. They encounter a white woman who talks to them and the children are surprised. They have never seen anybody throwing away food. She later asks them their age and takes a picture of them and asks them to smile. On their way home, they talk a lot about their dreams of buying a big house and getting married, from getting away from Budapest and going for higher education. Others talk about going to America. At home, they're shocked to see uh, struck sooner, advises them to run. Um, the truck has come to collect them. They are arrested and taken to juvenile jail. Chipo gave birth there, and the writer learns to read and write later on. So her uh, resilience in the face of prejudice is evident in this story. The next story is Missing Out by Leila Abolelas from Sudan. This is about culture shock. And the culture shock is brought because of going to study abroad and encountering a way of life that is different from that which the narrator is used to. Maji, brilliant and ambitious Muslim man, has gone to London 
for his father's studies. Surprisingly, he writes to his mother back at home that he would not make it and is almost giving up after failing the first exam. His mother gets scared and hatches a plan to find him a wife, believing that this will help him settle in London. He marries Samra and this boosts his concentration in his studies. When Samra learns that Maji is gradually abandoning his Islamic faith as he does not observe the mandatory prayers, the problem in this homestead begins. He also has embraced the way of life that is strange. Maji, on the other hand, feels that Samra is missing out on civilization. She sticks to her religious ways of life even way back in London. Maji cannot come to terms with why Sumra is not excited by opportunities their new life holds. She is still stuck in the past, yet there are so many choices according to her husband. Our next story is No Need to Lie by Ralph Smith of Kenya. The Will to Fight Cancer. Ralph narrates his long fight and determination to destroy and smash throat cancer. He is diagnosed with throat cancer when he's 50 years and he dismisses and is in denial at first. He thought that the tons, it was a simple tonsil that will disappear. When the pain gets worse, he decides to go for medical assistance and after the test, is confirmed that he has third stage cancer. He is devastated but consoled by the fact that unlike AIDS, he can fight cancer. He must go through radiotherapy and chemotherapy to kill the cells from his body. And he experiences severe pain, body loss, loss of hair and eating problems because of the pain. He responds to treatment appropriately and through family, friends and well-wishers is flown to Germany for further treatment. And his attitude helps him overcome the cancer. He defeats cancer and is given a heroic welcome when he returns to Nairobi because of his resilient nature. He fights cancer. Our next story is The Handsomest Drawn Man in the World by Gabriel Marcuse, Latin America. This is about an eye-opener. The Handsomest Drawn Man in the World opens with some children who are playing in the beach. They're playing in the waves and they see a strange, dark and ickly object approaching. In this story, they discover that it's the body of a drowned man. The women of the village prepare the man for burial and decide to call him Esteban. They wonder how handsome he is compared to their husband. He's better than them in almost all the qualities. His gait his physical qualities, and this makes the husbands jealous of the dead man. They confirm to women of Esteban, claiming that there's no need to uh, claim such things of a dead man. After funeral, the funeral of Esteban, the members of the village have an eye-opening session when they see how desolate and horrible the village is. He's put to rest in the ocean and they can now begin to uh, implement some changes in their village to honor Esteban who had superior qualities. They build the houses with wider doors, higher ceilings and stronger floors and they plant flowers uh, so that the memory of Esteban will be uh, reminisced by the sailors who go through the water. The next story is Stones Bounds on Water by Dilman Dilla of Uganda. It's about greed and betrayal. Meg and Joe Paulson are taking tea with their visitors Winnie, Hooge and her husband Peter, Winnie's cousin Tim Collins and Chelsea enjoying themselves in a serene environment. Winnie and other partners run a chain of shopping malls she has been married three times but has no children. An explosion from a firecracker is heard 
and Winnie is afraid. In their confusion, Winnie mistakenly picks the, ma- the, the, the cup of Meg, who usually mixes her tea with waragi, a local brew. After taste, she spits it out, and she says that somebody is trying to kill her. But when she learns her mistakes, she apologizes. The narrator, the next morning, realized that Winnie is missing, and nobody knows what has happened to her. Sergeant Kivumbi, the police commandant, begins an investigation and interrogates them. Later on, the body is found in a pond which Tim and Simon had earlier visited. Winnie is careful with her husband. Her visitors thinking that they wanted to poison her. Her husband is interrogated at length about the project they are running with Winnie. Collins and Chelsea are interrogated as well, but they don't have a clue about who really gets to kill her. Six more officers are called to the investigation. Uh, they look through her house but get no evidence. Scotland Yard conclude that all the five came together to kill Winnie. The five later won the case. Peter, Winnie's husband, later marries Chelsea, Winnie's cousin. Tim was their best man. Tim and Peter later disagree on how to share what they have acquired. And they talk against each other and witness against one another. And this gives the court an easy way to make a final ruling. This marks the end of our audio session of all the stories in Memories We Lost and other stories. Always tap the subscribe button to get the best analysis and summary of the story.